Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Word of God for our study this Sunday is our second lesson. Romans 13 verses 11 to 14 is printed in your bulletin and already read. Dear friends in Christ, a hit song from the band Chicago way back in the 70s asked, does anybody really know what time it is? Well, even if I had no clock or calendar, my email the last week would have made sure I knew. It was time to shop. Time to grab those Black Friday deals before they disappear. Time to save big. Time to get the biggest savings of the year. Some of those emails even dared to mention something about some holiday called Thanksgiving. But for the most part, the focus was all about the all-important day that followed that one. Unfortunately for the retailers, that multitude or cavalcade of email ads did not actually manage to motivate me to wake up on Friday morning or to shop or even rouse me enough later in the day to make my way to their stores or neither in person nor online. As far as they were concerned, I might as well have just spent the day asleep in bed, which would have been nice. But it's not just merchants who want my attention. There are countless other people, groups, and movements who want me, who want all of us to wake up and appreciate what time it is. Some want us to be woke, to see it's time to stand up against things like sexism, income inequality, homophobia, or toxic masculinity. Others urge us to wake up and see that we're running out of time in the culture war to, to stand up for traditional values, morality, and capitalism. Some want us to wake up and, and know that we're in a climate crisis that requires major sacrifices right now. Others want to rouse us from our slumbers to protect the economic system that we have before it's too late. The season of Advent also wants our attention, wants us to be awake, watching, and ready, because our Lord is coming. And we don't know when, but He is coming soon. A reading today from Isaiah 2 encourages us to look forward to that coming with eager optimism. The kingdom of the Messiah will be a place of perfection. It will be a place of peace. It will be a, an existence beyond compare, beyond our imagination, and wonderful in every way. Look forward to that. Our gospel today has a more somber tone, one of warning. Jesus tells us that when he returns, it will be like a thief coming in the night at an unexpected hour, and wicked and unbelieving sinners will be taken in judgment, completely unprepared for what they should have known was coming. Our second reading and text today from Romans 13 kind of combines the tones and messages of the other two readings while looking forward to the final salvation that awaits us when Christ returns, we must still appreciate the danger of being caught unready when he comes. And so Paul here talks about how we will live our lives in the meantime, how we walk because we're awake. We might say that the first thing should be the most obvious. Walk with your eyes open. Bad things happen when you don't. More, more specifically, the, the apostle is telling us that knowing and understanding what time it is makes a difference, or should, in all that we do. It's kind of funny how in our society today, we have clocks everywhere. On our phones, on our computers, in our cars, on our TVs, in our cable boxes, on signs. And, and some people even still put clocks on their walls and, and, and watches on their wrists. Almost all of these timepieces are, are synced 
And many of them give very precise readouts so that we can know the precise second of anything happening to or around us. And yet, so many people are still so often so unaware of what time it is. They seem to have no idea that Judgment Day is coming, and soon. They live their lives as though Christ is never, ever coming back, and and for the most part, as though they are never going to meet Him in death either. Perhaps they have simply decided that there will be no judgment and that there is no judge. But we know better. We have the Word of God. The Scriptures tell us what we need to know, not only about the Lord's return and what will happen then, but also about how to be prepared to meet Him with repentant faith. We understand the present time. Which means that we know it is already the hour for us to wake up from sleep because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. That's not to say that we are not saved now, but we do not fully experience our salvation this side of Judgment Day. Because even though our sins are fully forgiven in Christ, that's what He did for us with His suffering and death on the cross, we still live in a world full of sin and still have sinful natures that constantly struggle with our new natures, to gain control of our lives. But when Jesus comes again, it will be the day of final redemption when we are at last fully free of every trap and trace of sin and free forever to live as God created us to live. And because time passes, Moving forward, every day and hour and minute, the day of that salvation comes ever nearer, ever nearer, and nearer. The long night of our lives in the darkness of this sin-cursed world is almost over. And a new day of glorious light in the Lord's presence will soon be dawning for all who believe. So, and it's a big so, so leave the things of darkness behind, in the dark, for the dark. But what do you want them for? Instead, take up the things of light, the, the weapons that are the only things that can destroy the darkness, the gospel. The gospel and the word of God in in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. Faith, Christian love, forgiveness, compassion, patience, joy, grace in action, peace. And remember something. You you, you can't flip a switch or, or, or turn on a flash dark on a sunny day and suddenly diminish the light. While light has the power to dispel darkness, darkness has no power against light. So be confident. Be confident with the weapons that the Holy Spirit has given you to use as you make your way through the dimness and shadows of this world. But also, also be the Christian that He has made you. Walk decently as in the daytime. In the dark, people can do all sorts of things with the expectation that they will never be seen. But believers understand that everything is exposed. So we live our lives as though the world is watching. It is. And as though God is always watching. He is. We know that nothing is ever truly hidden from Him. 
But we also understand that we have nothing to hide when we are living as God has called us to live. And even when we fail to follow His will, He is ready with forgiveness when we own our sin and turn to Him in repentance and trust in His grace. But we need to be reminded of these things, as Paul reminds us here. Because life as sinners in this sinful world means that darkness is often passed off as light and light as darkness. And there are countless voices telling us to to get with the times when what they mean is to forget what time it really is. Time to prepare for Christ's coming with repentance and faith and lives of Christian obedience. All sorts of sins and lifestyle choices that Scripture clearly condemns are now things to be celebrated. And brokenness and corruption are redefined as fashionable and cool. We are encouraged to live our lives not in the daylight of God's gaze, but for the audience of Twitter or Instagram. And political candidates try to sell us on the idea that all the problems of our lives can be solved by punishing other people or taking their things and giving them to us. But that is not the way we walk awake. We understand that these and so many other things have no place in a Christian's life and no place in a Christian family or congregation or community. No carousing. We don't dedicate our lives or even our weekends to the pursuit of pleasure. No drunkenness. We value self-control, not ceding control to drugs or drink. No sexual sin and no wild living. We know that God's plan for marriage and sex is, is not only clearly taught in the Bible, but also what is clearly best for us, all of us. No strife or jealousy. Those are some of the devil's favorite things. They belong in the dark and they shrivel up in the daylight when we walk there. So instead of covering ourselves with the things that the world and our sinful natures say are good and valuable, Paul encourages us to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a powerful and vivid image that the Apostle uses elsewhere as well. What we want others to see when they look at us. What we want to identify as. or What we want as a reminder of of what the Lord has done for us. That is what we want to, to put on and wear all the time. We are Christ's witnesses, the ones who represent Him to this world as as His ambassadors. And so we remember that unbelievers are watching us. And so are our families, our children, and other Christians who can be encouraged or discouraged by what they see. So we clothe ourselves with Christ which means also that we do not make any provision, we do not give any thought to satisfying the desires of our flesh, the things that only rise up from sin and not from the holiness of our new nature. Imagine a husband dedicated to his wife, promising always to be faithful, who, who had a bar with some friends, is slipped a phone number by an attractive young woman. And he takes that phone number and slips it into his wallet just in case. He's giving thought to something that does not fit at all with what he has said he's all about. Or imagine the recovering alcoholic buying a bottle of whiskey and hiding it behind the books on his shelf just in case sometime he decides he's going to give up on his sobriety and go back to what he was before. It makes no sense. That doesn't fit with what he has decided about who he is. Yet Christians too often do the same thing. We make provisions 
for the desires of our sinful nature. Maybe it's the plans we make. Maybe it's when we say, you know what, I'm not going to do this thing because it might get in the way of that other thing I really want to do. Maybe we decide, you know, I'm not going to speak up and condemn that thing that is actually sin because someday, maybe tomorrow, I might want to commit that sin myself and I don't want it coming back to me. That's not what we do when we walk decently as in the daytime, when we walk clothed with Christ. Because we understand the present time. We're awake. We know that it is already the hour to wake up because our salvation is nearer now than we when we first believed. The night is almost over. We know this. The day is drawing near. So this is how we walk through this world that is full of darkness, but it is longing for the light that we have to bring and that we know we will see. It's always nice when choosing the hymns for our services to realize that the people who have written our hymns are reading the same Bible we use. The last hymn that we're going to sing today, The Advent of Our King, I'm quite positive the author read with Romans 13 in mind. I will read right now just the last three verses of that hymn. And I think you'll see what I mean. As judge on clouds of light, he soon will come again, and his true members all unite with him in heaven to reign. Before the dawning day, let sin's dark deeds be gone, the sinful self be put away, the new self now put on. All glory to the Son who comes to set us free, Father, Spirit, ever one, through all eternity. Alleluia. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.